Snurzy sent me this scope and I'll be comparing that to my Riggle scope which costs twice as much and weighs three times as much so not exactly a fair comparison. So this being much simpler has some advantages and this one's now ready to use this one's still booting. I'll just cut a bit of time out here the Fnerzy took four and a half seconds to show a trace the Riggle 21. And this one has a fan that I can always hear, and I find it actually quite annoying. And now there's no sound, because this one just runs off of a simple USB adapter. So at 4.9 volts, it draws 1.05 amperes. So about 5 watts to run the whole scope. And I can actually run this off of this cheap little power bank here. And the Regal has to run straight off of AC and it consumes 17 watts, which is actually not bad either. And this one also has a built-in signal generator, which the Regal doesn't have. And I can change various parameters here, like the frequency or the type of waveform. So right now I've got a 1004 hertz sawtooth waveform, which I'm displaying on both of these at 50 microseconds per division. But let's zoom out on both of these a bit. And that's fine. Zoom out some more. Zoom out some more. And now this looks a bit funny. It's got these jaggedies on here. Uh, let's zoom out another step. And another step on here. And it looks even weirder. Let's uh, zoom out some more. And this shows that there's a whole lot of waveforms on here. And this just looks weirder and weirder. And let's zoom out another step. We got our sawtooth back. Isn't that weird? Uh, I zoom out here and I don't have that. So what's going on here? Because if I look at that same waveform at 10 milliseconds per division on this one, it shows it correctly. I can zoom in on this and I see my triangle waveform. And on this one, it just uh, it's a triangle waveform, but it jumps up and down. And on this one, I can only zoom in about a factor of 10. So this is what was acquired, and I go one, two, three steps, and I can't go any further. And what's happening here is this has got a very short trace buffer, and when I go into the furthest zoom in, it hides the fact that it only has so few samples by interpolating in between, which at least you can tell it's doing that because the interpolation method is imperfect, and it makes it smaller. So at least uh, it's obvious that it's like, okay, this is just garbage now. And with this one, if I zoom out, uh, basically make the time base longer, now it actually looks like I've got my sawtooth wave back, even though the trace is going at 50 milliseconds per division. So that's telling me it's sampling at 1 kilohertz, and with my waveform at 1004 hertz, I basically get aliasing, making it look like a 4 hertz sawtooth wave. Which is to say, each 50 millisecond division has actually only got 50 A to D samples in it, and counting across, we've got 14 divisions, so 50 samples times 14, we only have 700 A to D samples across the screen. And that's all we got. Zooming in doesn't give me any more samples. Now compare that to the Riggle. So let's go out to 50 milliseconds per division, and I'll stop, and then I can zoom in, and zoom in, and zoom in, and you can still see there's, for instance, these tiny little waveform thingies, so I've zoomed in to um, one microsecond per division and it's got enough samples to give me details there too and if I zoom in further now I'm at the limit of how far I can zoom in and uh, basically we can tell here it's still got lots of samples across the screen because this thing has got a six million point trace buffer if I'm using one trace if I've got two traces then that's shared so I only get three million points trace buffer versus just 700 on the FNERSI and right now what I've got is 60 Hz AC from this benchtop power supply going into both of these. And if I'm looking for, say, some kind of a glitch where the signal gets interrupted, like this, this one is much faster at displaying that sort of thing than this one is. But for that sort of thing, what's really useful is something called roll mode. Um, so I'll switch this into roll mode where the signal just kind of scrolls across here and this one doesn't have that so now if I've got my glitch I can 
react fast enough to hit the button on here to see that because a lot of times the glitch may be something that I can't trigger on so I have to manually stop it and then I can just go to where that glitch was and zoom in on it and see details of that glitch which in this case is not terribly interesting whereas on this one it locks roll mode and even if it had roll mode with 600 samples across here you can't really effectively zoom in and analyze after the fact I've been playing around with decoding the pulse codes from infrared remotes so if I push enter on here that shows me what I pushed and the scope is really useful for debugging that so as I push different buttons on the remote I can see how the pulses vary on here and the scope is good at displaying that but on my wriggle it just seems to flash away and that's because there's more pulses after that one and this one re-triggers in time this one takes a while before it's ready for a re-trigger but I'm also not able to fit the whole code on here so let's change the time base to zoom out a bit and now I can see there's a follow-up pulse for this but even at 50 milliseconds per division on both of these this one still doesn't fit everything on here because it turns out this has got 12 divisions across and this has got 14 divisions because the area dedicated to the trace on this one is actually a fair bit bigger because this one has all these other menus on here that take up space and this one doesn't so I wanted to change the time base for the longer code for this one so right now it works I zoom out on the time base so 10 milliseconds now going to 20 milliseconds per division and I lose my trigger level display and I have no idea where the starting point is supposed to be at this point so very confusing that way so possibly if I move the horizontal trigger position to be on the screen and now zoom out no, still weird and even changing the level here it doesn't show the trigger until I change my zoom so zooming out too far makes that trigger disappear whereas on the wriggle I got lots of room on there and then I can just zoom in to analyze all that in detail now I've been noticing some glitches on the waveform here and so let's uh, make that a bit bigger to look at it and let's move that down you can see various glitches now notice the trigger is still at the same point on the screen so let me show you this I moved the trigger level up and I can trigger just fine now I change the volts per division to make this smaller and it no longer triggers because my trigger level didn't get moved on the screen so by zooming in and out on the voltage the actual trigger voltage changes of course it's not really supposed to work that way so on this one you can see if I change the volts per division the trigger moves with it but uh, back to those glitches so I noticed they're on the top and the bottom these glitches so let's uh, make this a bit bigger and we can see these glitches here from time to time well look at there that's a big one um, so I'm kind of what is causing these glitches to narrow it down I'm just gonna disconnect the power for my embedded system here and let's just hit auto on this one to try to find the glitches and look at that we got glitches galore so all kinds of spikes here same settings on here I just get uh, a very fuzzy waveform and if I zoom in way on that we see all kinds of spikes too and it turns out the spikes are actually much much shorter they're just a few nanoseconds in length this one of course aliases because it just samples once in a while so it doesn't capture the true thing like this one can but playing around with it if I pull the probe from this scope here then we just get 60 Hertz that is picking up just off of the air but the glitches are gone so are the glitches coming from here so now I replace this circuit with just a 1k resistor we're still seeing the glitches and as before by disconnecting the wriggle glitches go away so is my wriggle sabotaging the other scope by feeding it glitches so I've now just flipped it around so that my wriggle is measuring the ground level of the FNERSI and the FNERSI is measuring the ground level of the wriggle and they both show a similar sort of thing again lots of aliasing on here because it doesn't take so many samples but it appears that the ground of these two is relatively bouncing around 
And I finally figured it out. So let's zoom in on these spikes here. And they look kind of interesting, about 30 kilohertz. Now let's take the other probe on the other channel and just hold it near the power adapter for this other thing. And look at what I see here. If it's not near, I get nothing. If I hold it next to the power adapter, I get a very similar waveform just coming out of the power adapter. So let's try a different power adapter. And look at that. Noise is almost gone. And that's using the power adapter that came with my iPad 10. It seems to be much quieter than this one that came with the scope. But uh, testing this one and this one, they're just as bad. They all seem to be noisy except for this one and this one, which is for my iPad 7, I think. So these cheap adapters seem to introduce some high frequency common mode noise, basically in ground and power. Not so much that the power is noisy, but there's common mode noise on there, which the scope is very sensitive to. Whereas these two, which are from my Apple iPads, do much less of that. So I guess uh, the higher cost of Apple products isn't just to make higher profits for Apple. They also sell you something that's a little bit better. And the high frequency noise fed into ground, of course, makes the scope's ground bounce around a bit. And that makes, basically, it makes it look like the signal's got glitches when it doesn't. And I guess this is why they limit the uh, gain on here to 50 millivolts per division. So that this noise that gets introduced uh, can't be displayed too well on its own. But on my wriggle, I can crank the gain up to 1 millivolt per division. And that's quite sensitive, although it's a little bit cheating. Because if I zoom in on this here, you can see that the signal has these stair steps in it which uh, it shouldn't have, so that's telling me it's basically magnifying the last little bit of A to D levels on here to get more. So it's, it's a bit more like a digital zoom here, you can really see the levels. Whereas if I zoom out, we don't see that sort of uh, stair steppy thing so much. And finally I want to test the frequency response of this FNERSI scope, so I'm using a Pi Pico as a signal generator using a little MicroPython program to cycle through some frequencies and just checking this with my Rigol scope which is ready to go to 200 megahertz. And the Rigol is showing the frequency down here. So this is 8.3 it says, 15.6, 20.8, 31, and 62.5. And you see the amplitude stays pretty much the same except for the final 65 megahertz. That one's a little bit attenuated. Let's switch over to the FNERSI. And this one is also measuring the frequency. Now 15, 20, 31, and 37. So somehow it thinks my 65 megahertz frequency is 37 megahertz. But uh, never mind that for now. What's the bandwidth? So at the 8 megahertz, we can see it's roughly a square wave. We go up to those lines I've put on there, and then by the time we get to this, we're probably about 3 dB down, so that was the third frequency. So I'll wait for that to come around again, and that is the 20.8 megahertz. So we're down 3 dB at about 20.8 megahertz. So I'd say the actual frequency response of the FNERSI is somewhere around 20 megahertz, not the 100 that it's rated for. And uh, given how it gets the 65 megahertz frequency completely wrong, I would recommend you don't trust it for anything above 20 megahertz. So what I do now, I really want it to like this scope because it's small and light and low power and quiet. And the idea of a very simple low spec oscilloscope was just very appealing. But uh, given its limitations, now I'm kind of like, I just can't trust it. Uh, the fact that it only goes to 20 megahertz is really not a problem to me. It's all the other things that are kind of a problem. So lacking roll mode, the trace buffer being way too short, no oversampling, so you get lots of aliasing, the sensitivity only going to 50 millivolts, that's a big one, uh, the noise from the power adapter, the trigger behaving funny if you change the voltage level or if you zoom out too much, like too long a time base, bandwidth only 10, 20 megahertz, again not that big of an issue for me, and then it got the 65 megahertz completely wrong, that's kind of like, okay, can I trust this thing at all? And looking back on all of my YouTube videos where I actually use an oscilloscope, this would have only been usable for half of them because 
The other half I either used roll mode and then zoomed in and needed to, or needed more sensitivity. But then, you know, there's still half of the videos where I could have used this. So I don't know, if it's something that I know I'm not going to go outside the capabilities of this one, I may still end up using it because it's just, you know, it's a nice, simple, light scope. It's just got lots of problems. Now I did email Fnerzy after I did my initial tests and I pointed out that there's a bunch of things not ideal about it, although a few things I liked and they're pretty gracious about just go ahead and don't let us influence you so I am publishing this video without them reviewing it so gotta give them credit for that. And they also sent me a link for the scope plus a few other products and actually some of these, the bridge tweezers and the transistor tester look very appealing. So in fact, I just ordered the bridge tweezers myself. I'm not sure if I'll make a video about them, but I'll put all these links in the video description.